Hello, everyone. I'm Kyle Gerald, and I have the privilege of being the pastor of Countryside Free Methodist Church in Sandusky, Michigan. The message you are about to hear was previously recorded. If you'd like to catch one of our services in action, we'd love to have you stop by for our 10 a.m. service. Please note that's a new time for us. Or check it out on our Facebook page at Countryside Free Methodist Church. God bless you, and thank you for listening. I want to invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 1. Okay, and Philippians is uh, book number 50 out of 66 books in the Bible, which means it's going to be toward the back of those, you know, non-digital or classic Bibles, okay, the paper version. You guys, I think that you are really going to enjoy the book of Philippians. It is special. And we're going to get to that special, that whole special thing here in just a moment. But I want to focus just for a brief moment on this slide right here, this whole concept of rejoicing. And guys in the sound tech, in the sound booth, I'm picking up Carrie's mic, I believe, here, turning it on, because I'm going to do a little walking today. All right, so here's what I need. I need a couple people, first of all, to share with me, what does it mean, do you think, to rejoice? Okay, it's not a trick question, okay? Okay, your best answer is the right answer. So what does it mean to rejoice? Somebody. Up, oh, back. Thank you for being in the back. I appreciate that. Get the old cardiovascular going. circumstances. All right, to rejoice, to be thankful in all circumstances. Okay, good. Okay, anybody else? What's it mean to rejoice? Again? Oh, re, re, rejoice. Rejoice. So like to, 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 so what's the joyce then? Okay, so what's the re, what is the re thing that we're doing again? What is it? You want to, oh, thank you. Next door. Yep. Joy. Joy. Okay, so re, joy. All right, so, so like re give to joy. All right, now, so joy, we basically know that's kind of a, happy happiness thing right but a lot of times we think it's actually it's, there, it goes with something deeper too but a lot of times it is that expression of happiness that pleasant attitude and stuff that, that's going on so let me take it one step further what is something that has caused you to rejoice lately okay something that has that has helped you or caused you to rejoice lately guys we have so much to be thankful for and to rejoice about uh, in Christ, the best is yet to come. Amen? Amen. And I just want to share one, one other one uh, that I experienced, one reason, the thing that brought me joy this past week. You guys, I got to, I got to hang out with our teens on Wednesday night. Uh, me and my, my daughter, Becca, were, were helping uh, lead the teens. And, and we got to, this might sound a little silly to you, but we got to play some nine square out on the Parsonage front lawn with the teens, and we had a blast. And you guys, I haven't laughed that hard in a really long time. I mean, talk about just pure joy. It was just a joyful time, you know, as we were hitting the ball over back and forth and, and trying to get to that, that special spot. Some of you don't know, have a clue what I'm talking about. That's okay. It's like nine-way volleyball. That's all you need to know, okay? So it's so much fun. But I, so what I, I'm, I'm, where I'm going with all this is this is all pointing us back to Philippians chapter 1, which, like I said, the book of Philippians, I think you're going to love because it is such a special book. Now, I know that 2, Crim, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says that all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching and rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. But you guys, I want to tell you there is just something special about the book of Philippians. It is just loaded with verses and lines that most of us have heard before, and hopefully we are working to commit to memory so that we can take them with us wherever we go. Verses like our memory challenge for this month, so I'm hoping that you guys will all take on this challenge. Philippians 4, 6, and 7, which says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, Present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Isn't that good? I sincerely hope that you will join us in making an effort to commit those two verses to memory this month. I mean, that's some practical, everyday wisdom for all of us. There's so much craziness, as Becca mentioned, going on in our world these days. It would be easy to get anxious and worried about it, wouldn't it? Some of us are there right now, anxious and worried about it. But, but here in Philippians, Paul gives us a very practical tool and a promise in it, when it comes to combating that anxiety that is all around us. I mean, the tool is this. In every situation, Paul says, 
by prayer and petition. And don't forget this part. With thanksgiving, present your request to God. And then the promise part, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That's the promise. That's God's part. That's what he's going to give to us. You guys, good stuff. We're going we're gonna to dig into that more in a couple of weeks. Um, those two verses are also right smack in the middle of the passage that has verses like these. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. And finally, uh, verse 8 says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, Think about such things. And you see what I mean? Philippians is gold. And it has been called both the epistle of excellent things and also the epistle of joy. Show of hands, who needs more joy in their life? Okay, I do. I, I'll admit it, okay? So over the next th several weeks, as we walk through this wonderful book, you're going to see words like joy and rejoice and in Christ over and over again. And my, my hope and my prayer is that as we dig into God's word, as we dig into these pages of Philippians, that not only will you see others in the text experiencing joy in Christ, but that you too will uncover it yourself and share in their delight. So are you ready? Let's, let's dig in this morning. A little warm up as we get into verse 1. Okay, Paul kind of lets us get our toes wet here. He starts off with Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons. Now, I know on the surface, that sounds like a pretty standard greeting from the Apostle Paul, you know, letter to one of the churches out there. But let's not gloss over some of the important nuggets in here. Paul indicates, first of all, the other person who's writing this letter along with him, Timothy, who was his trainee, his partner, his friend, his co-worker in the ministry. And that part's pretty standard. But then Paul uses the phrase, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. Some translations say slaves of Christ Jesus. You see, normally when Paul starts a letter, he throws out, you know, one of his credentials, like apostle of Christ. Um, giving them a reason why they should not only read carefully, but follow the instructions that he has included in, their, in his letter to them. But here, he doesn't do that. In Philippians, he starts out this way. Again, almost bringing himself down to a lower level. Because you see, he had this special connection with the people in the Philippian church. The people there were his close friends. So he didn't need to give them reasons to listen to him. He knew they would. So instead of apostle, he and Timothy present themselves with the much more humble title of servants of Christ Jesus. And he continues, to all God's holy people. Now, that term holy people is often misunderstood. I, know, I don't know. For a lot of people, it makes them think that's like a super holy, you know, Christian kind of person you want to try to avoid or something. Somebody, somebody with some sort of superior morality or character. But the truth is, in both the Old Testament and here in the New Testament, it's really all about people who are set apart to be different from the rest of the world. In the Old Testament, for example, God chose Abraham's family to be set apart, to be different from all the other nations. And he did that through the covenant of circumcision and the laws that he gave to Moses. And he did so in order that this special people, the Israelites, could show other people the way back to God, back to him, so that they could put away those false gods that they were worshiping and come back to the one true God. But instead of keeping God's instructions for being different, they adopted the practices and the ways of the nations around them, including the worship of those false gods. So his plan was for this set-apart people, this holy people, to point the way back to God. But they kept going their own way instead. So we turn the page into the New Testament, and we see that God chose to raise up a new group of holy people called Christians, or followers of Christ, to be like Jesus, 
to be different, to be set apart from the rest of the world in order that they might point the lost people in this world back to their heavenly father. So Paul addresses this letter to all of God's holy people in Christ Jesus. Uh, Bible scholar Marvin R. Vincent says that the concept of the environment in which a Christian lives is very similar to that of a bird in the air or a fish in the water or even of roots of a tree in the soil. Folks, a, a Christian must be in Christ, living and moving and breathing in Christ. That's how we are to become and to remain God's holy people, by being and living in Christ. And if we are for only sometimes in Christ, but then sometimes not, or sometimes living the way the world does, how are we really any different than the people of Israel that kept turning aside from God's ways to adopt the ways of this world? But to Paul, the Philippian church, the people in Philippi, they were living up to God's standard of holiness, living in Christ like a fish in water. And if you're wondering this morning how that is even possible, I've got some good news for you. Because I believe we're going to see some of those reasons, some of those, the reasons behind how Paul can say that here in the text and in the lines of Philippians. And I hope that that will make you rejoice. So look down at verses 3 through 6 with me. Paul continues in chapter 1. He says, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. I want to give you three big takeaways this morning from Philippians chapter 1. Number one, rejoice. God has a plan. Now, as Paul begins this letter to the Philippians, you can tell he's very positive. I mean, he's got phrases in there like, I thank my God, and I always pray with joy. And do you see why? There's really two main reasons. First of all, Paul considers the Philippians partners with him in his ministry, in, in the spreading of the gospel. And their prayers and their support and their encouragement were a big part of him and his ministry. And from what I understand, the church in Philippi was the only church from which Paul accepted a gift to help him in his ministry. And the second main reason for Paul's joy here is because of his confidence in Christ. His confidence in Christ of the process going on in the lives of the Philippians. Guys, he was there with them when the church started. He was part of the process. He was aware of their growth and development, both from being there among them and also from the letters that they had exchanged back and forth. But most importantly, he was aware of God's plan to finish what he had started. See, God's plan is not to bring people into his family with a prayer of salvation and then just dump them off and go on to somebody else. You guys know God's plan is so much better than that. His plan is to completely envelop each person. Scripture says that God does not want anyone to be lost, but all to come to him. And he wants a family. He wants children in his, fam in his family. So his plan is for us to come together and to become fully devoted followers of Christ. Scholars tell us that this line here in Philippians, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on com to completion, doesn't really translate extremely well into our language. Because Paul says it's, it's actually in a part of the process of offering a sacrifice. And I want you to just get that picture in mind for a second, okay? The, for, the, for the Old Testament sacrifices, there were several steps. There was preparation process that came before the sacrifice. There was the, the actual sacrifice of the offering itself. And then there were steps afterward. And that's kind of the image that Paul has in this, in this whole thing, is that he wants people to understand that God is a part of the process from first all the way through to the end. You see... The key here is that it is God who is doing the work in us. It was his grace that was there before we even knew who he was. And it was Jesus, his son, who offered himself 
on the cross in our place. And it will be his power that raises us up at the last day. So comparatively, our part is really pretty small. We need to present ourselves to him as an offering that's ready and willing by repenting and professing our faith before our Father. We need to allow him to do the finishing work in us. Get this, folks. That's God's plan for his people, for enabling and empowering us to live as his holy people. We submit our lives to him, and he does this incredible work within us, start to finish. So rejoice. God has a plan. I don't know about you guys, but I'm a guy that needs to know there is a plan. All right? I, I like to know that there is a plan. Right? Our second big takeaway is this. Rejoice because his plan flows out of love. Look down at verses 9 through 11. Paul says, this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. So rejoice, his plan flows out of love. Now I know some of you may be thinking, yeah, yeah, Pastor Kyle, we get it. God's plan flows out of his love for us. You know, we, yeah, you've, you've said that kind of stuff a lot of, you know, around here. But wait, I want you guys to look at Paul's prayer here. Because his prayer is not about God's love, at least directly. But what does Paul pray? He says, I pray that your love may abound. Now, I know that that kind of sounds like a, a phrase you might read in a Valentine's Day card, you know, mushy. There you go, abounding love. Here you go, you know, have this. Um, but look at what he says next. How does he want it to abound? More and more in knowledge and depth of insight. There's some words you don't see on many Valentine's Day cards, okay? Yeah, love with more and more knowledge and depth of insight, right? But you see, Paul's not praying for his believing friends to have some starry-eyed puppy, puppy love kind of, you know, attitude towards other believers or toward God himself. But his is a love that, it, that is growing in knowledge and insight. And why is that? He says, so that you may be able to discern what is, get this, best, and that you may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Do you see, Paul wants his brothers and sisters in Christ to be growing in an eyes wide open, learning more and more truth each and every day, that kind of love. That's the kind of love Paul is praying for his friends, family there at Philippi, because that's the kind of love that we need to fulfill God's plan and purpose as his holy people. Listen, folks, don't be afraid of the truth. Run to the truth, okay? In John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. So guess what? If you are running toward the truth, you're running toward Jesus, right? But where we get in trouble, though, is when we stop running toward the truth. Or we start to avoid the truth. Or we try to hide the truth. That's when we get into trouble. Because if we start doing those things, we're no longer going to be able to discern what is best. And we will instead settle for our enemy's counterfeits. It might be a counterfeit of love. It might be his counterfeit of integrity or counterfeit of morality or purity. But we will start to settle for those things rather than God's true, pure love. So the good news is this, that, that the love that Paul is praying to be developed in his fellow believers is directly connected to God's love. And it's modeled in the person of Jesus Christ. So rejoice. His plan flows out of love. And we can see what that love looks like in the person of Jesus Christ and also in his dear followers like Paul. And finally, number three, rejoice because we can't lose. Paul includes this, this wonderful little window into his situation while he was writing to the Philippians. Check it out, starting at verse 12. It says, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me 
has actually served to advance the gospel. And I don't know about you, but I was thinking, all right, what's happened to Paul? What's, well, he's about to give us a clue. Verse 13. As a result, it's become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Folks, Paul was a prisoner in Rome as he was writing this letter. Now, if you want the details of how we got there, I'd encourage you to go back this afternoon and read through chapters 21 to 28 of the book of Acts. You want to see the whole story there. But the short version is this. The Jews in Jerusalem didn't like the fact that Paul, who was a former Pharisee, was now preaching the gospel. And so they incited the crowds to turn on him. And then the Romans came and, and took him into custody. Does that, does that sound familiar at all? And when Paul realized that he would be unable to get justice there in Jerusalem, he did what any Roman citizen could do. He appealed his case to Caesar, which means he would be taken to be able to plead his case before Caesar himself. So as a result of that, the Roman guards took him to Rome. And so he was there, still in custody in Rome. But even there, he is not deterred. Listen, as we continue in verse 14, he says, Because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. So because of Paul's predicament, his brothers and sisters in Christ were out there declaring the gospel even more fearlessly than before. So Paul is thinking, hey, you know what? This is okay. It's all right that I'm here if that's the result that's going to be happening out there among my brothers and sisters in Christ. And he goes on to continue in verse 15. He says, It's true, some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. And the former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. So, apparently, in addition to those who are proclaiming God, out of uh, a, a sincere attempt to advance God's kingdom, there was also a group of people who were out there preaching the gospel just to try to stir up pr trouble for Paul. So Paul says, but what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. So Paul was saying, if Jesus wins, I win. And guess what? Jesus is going to win. Right? In the end, Jesus wins, period. So Paul is celebrating. And, and Paul, sitting there in chains, says, Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage, so that now as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by my life or by my death. So Paul had come to the point in his life where his faith was strong because his faith was in Christ. And because of that, he knew his future was secure, no matter what happened next. And that leads us to this famous line that you've probably heard before. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. And if that's where you are at in life, like Paul, you can rejoice, my friend, because you can't lose. It is a win-win. Listen as he continues. If I'm going to go on living in the body, that's going to mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I don't know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it's more necessary for you that I remain in the body. See, Paul knew that if he were going to continue living, whether it was in chains in Rome or if he by chance was set free, he knew what he was going to do. His game plan was to continue spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. You guys, he still had plans. There were places he planned to go past Rome to spread the gospel. He had a missionary's heart. He had his eyes set on Spain and Europe, places that the gospel had never reached before. And that was what his plan was, was to go to those places and to share the gospel with people who had never heard it before. So if you're wondering, you know, which, what happened to Paul, you know, and what's going to, or what's going to happen, I can tell you, it sounds like if we look at the text here, 
that he was really thinking, you know, God's probably going to keep me around a little bit longer because, you know, he probably needs me to help you guys and some of those other churches a little bit more. So you can, you can tell that that's the way that he was leaning. But you can also see that his preference, he was torn because there was a big part of him that was ready to go home and be with the one who loved him most. So, either way, he couldn't lose, so he could rejoice. So just to recap here, rejoice, because God has a plan. And it starts with God, and it ends with God, and he does the heavy lifting in the middle. That's reason enough to rejoice right there, isn't it? And secondly, his plan flows out of love, and that love is modeled in the life of Jesus. It's there for all of us to see and to and to commit our lives to being like, like Jesus' love. And thirdly, we can't lose. If we are, like Paul, genuine disciples of Christ, seeking to be more and more like him, then whether we stay here, continue his work, or whether we depart and go home to be with him in eternity, we win. We have much to celebrate as God's people. So I will say it again, rejoice. And let me just add one last thought, that if you're, if you're listening this morning and you're saying, you know, I don't, I don't know that I'm quite there yet. I just want to invite you. Make this the day that you step across the line and say, Jesus, I need you in my life. I want, I want this joy that Paul is talking about. I want what I see, my friends who are followers of Christ. I want that joy that they have in their lives. I want it in mine. I just want to encourage you to submit your life to him and just ask him to come into your life and to be the Lord of your life. And if you'll do that, he will meet you there, and he will walk you the rest of the way in that relationship. And if you've got any questions about it, please feel free to come and talk to me. I would love to help you with those next steps in your faith walk. Will you join with me in prayer as we close out this morning? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for our time together here today. God, we are so blessed. We have so many reasons to rejoice. I am so glad that we took some time to share those things. And I know that there are so many other reasons represented here this morning. And God, we just want to continue to give you thanks and give you praise. And God, I pray that as we do, you would fill our hearts even more with joy. As we hear the joy from other people, that that adds to our joy. And we just add, ask that you would continue to help us as we do so. Share the joy that comes from knowing you, God. We're so thankful that you have a plan for us, that you've called us to be your holy people, to be different, set apart in a way that is, is pleasing to you, God, by following after Jesus. So God, I pray that you would help us each and every one to live up to that calling in the days ahead. And all God's people said, amen. amen. You guys, thanks so much for being here this morning. Have a wonderful week. God bless you guys.